2023 had the, the lowest amount of first time buyers in the okay. last 10 years in 1970 at that time the average house price was 3.5 times the average wage now it's about nine times the last three months of 2023 were positive rates were sort of quite consistently coming down slowly across the market in 2024 we've seen more of that i wouldn't expect us to go down to where rates were in 2020 or 2021 that was an all-time low historically that was the anomaly i'm not expecting to be back down there anytime soon when we're talking about buying residential yeah, properties yeah. you do have to consider it as an investment but also you're getting a roof over your head your mm -hmm. partner's head your kid's head just because somebody's bought sooner doesn't mean they've bought better and it doesn't mean that they're ahead it's just one i would say there's four questions you should ask before buying number one you're not defined by where you, where you come from yeah. and i think that's a big message that i always yeah. want to tell people like like you have to be able to be uncomfortable yeah. like be comfortable with being uncomfortable When you grow up in ends, you don't realise it when you're confident, but you have an audacity to do things that ordinarily most people wouldn't be willing to do. Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. We've got a special guest in the building. Dan, how are you doing today? Very well, thank you for uh, having me on. Yeah, you know what? It's been a it's been a long time coming, and as I was, as I was saying to you offline, I'm very I'm looking forward to this conversation because um, you know I haven't spoken about mortgages for probably over a year, and it's something that I've just done recently. I was telling you offline uh, that I did a remortgage uh, recently, and that's had a big impact. So I thought, you know what? Let's let's uh, have a podcast episode and talk about that. Uh, but before we start, uh, who is Dan? So um, I am um, a mortgage advisor who works primarily in the first time buyer market and um, sort of known online as Dan Does Mortgages. That's my tag. And yeah, I work with first time buyers across the UK, helping them to buy the first homes. Okay. Wow. So and you, and you focus on first time buyers, yeah? That's primarily who I work with. You okay. know, I won't turn anybody away. Okay. But primarily that's um, yeah, typically who I work with. Okay. Amazing. And because I've got a lot of first time buyer questions and I'm sure a lot of the, you know, the audience are going to be first time buyers and very keen to understand how they can uh, get onto the property market. But what we like to do, uh, we always like to, you know, delve a little bit into the background yeah. of the person that's on the podcast. So I guess, uh, I guess where are your parents from? So, um, I am from Sunderland, okay, um, cool. so in the northeast, um, sort of very typical working class, average background. Mm. Um, yeah, both my parents from Sunderland or surrounding areas. Dad's a milkman. Mom worked in okay, the offices milkman. at yeah. Nissan, which is sort of the main mm. car manufacturer based in Sunderland. Um, yes, yeah, so sort of a typical working class northeast lad <laughs> oh mad mad and how, how long did you uh grow, do you still live in Sunderland at the moment yeah yeah so yeah. I've lived in Sunderland within pretty much a three mile radius mm. since I was born mm. um same area still got all the same friends as when I was eight wow um I know sometimes people sort of think you shouldn't but yeah um and yeah I love it I love I love where we're from what's Sunderland like I've never been to Sunderland so I, I, you know I'm very keen to hear what it's like what's like yeah. life like growing up there so Sunderland is, um, I think people, especially my age, are very proud to come from Sunderland. I think people tip from the northeast are mm. the northeast. Without getting sort of too political, is sort of the forgotten or one of the forgotten regions <laughs> yeah, of the country. Yeah, um, you know, there's not the level of opportunity that there might be, you know, down in London, for example. Um, but yeah, you know, like anywhere, it's got its, you know, it's it's not so nice parts, but it's got a beautiful coastline. Um, I've grew up there my full life. And yeah, I had a very, very happy childhood yeah. in Sunderland and st still there. Wow, wow. So you said that like your uh, your parents, one, your mum worked in Nissan, your dad worked as a milkman. Yeah. I guess, what was it that kind of led you to be like, you know, I want to like get into finances? Um. So for me growing up, it was always sport. Mm. I was always going to work in sport. Okay. That was always the intention. Ah. And then I got to that sort of... um. Late teens, early twenties, um, maybe wasn't sure what exactly what it is I wanted to do. The same as everybody else, really. Uh, I was going to be a PE teacher. Did a lot of work as a PE teacher in schools. Didn't really yeah. enjoy it, um, and it wasn't it wasn't what I thought sport should be in schools. And yeah, I just thought it wasn't maybe it wasn't what I always thought was going to be growing up. Yeah. So 
at that time, I'd always worked part-time jobs in finance. Um, so then I simply just moved and got a full-time job in finance. Okay. Um, worked for quite a few years at Santander. Okay, nice. Um, up until 2020, I worked in PPI. Okay, um, the notorious PPI. Yeah, yeah okay. so I was, I was a contractor in PPI, um, worked in sort of um, quality control. So when people would make a claim, my sort of colleagues would then reply to that claim and I would then assess the quality of that. Mm. So I did that until 2020, um, but due to the nature of PPI, we always knew that was going to end Right, and that the okay. job was going to end because there was a time limit on the claims. Yeah. And yeah, COVID sort of put put an end to that. So I was always planning ahead for what I was going to do next. Mm. Mad. That's crazy. I want to go, go a bit back to, you know, obviously growing up. School-wise, were you like proper into like education at, at school and stuff like that? Or? No. So in terms of school, GCSE level, I could always, I was quite fortunate. I could always sort of... um I could sort of get the grades that I needed relatively mm. easily. But now I was maybe the typical, you know, class clown. Um, okay. <laughs> chatter, you know, a lot of chatter in the yeah. classes. Um, you know, not like, you know, really doing anything seriously wrong, but just, you know, a bit yeah. of a class clown, you know, loud voice at the back of the class. Um, but no, I did, I did, I did well at school. Um, then went on to sixth form and then university. Okay. What did you study at uni? Sports science. Okay, so you so you actually were really yeah, serious yeah. about the sports thing. Yeah. So then why, I guess, why do you go ahead with it? Like, why do you just, like, give up on it? I wouldn't say I give up. I just, I think at the time, I, oh, I played a lot of sport growing up. Mm. And then when I got to that age, I've had, I had a lot of injuries, which essentially meant I couldn't play sport anymore. Okay. And so I just fell out of love with it. And then okay. at the same time, I was doing the work in, in schools and... Mm. And I just didn't, I wasn't really enjoying it. Yeah. I maybe just thought, especially in terms of being a PE teacher, do I want to work in a school for however many years in this environment? Um, and the answer was no. So I just mm. sort of made the decision to step away from it. But it was hard because I'd sort of trained and became sort of, did a lot of qualifications and different mm -hmm. sports. Um, and then, yeah, just made the decision to wow. move into finance. Wow. Okay. That's cool. Uh, you know what? It's, it's quite good to to be able to like say to yourself, you know what? Even though I used to love this, yeah. now it's not really for me. Because we kind of sometimes grow out things that we thought that we mm -hmm. would, you know, kind of like, yeah. right? Exactly. Like like the way, I, the way I like in it is like finance. I've grown to love finance. Whereas I've always been interested in business, but yeah finance i wouldn't say like yeah i was like a into finance like i was a finance whiz yeah. at even university so yeah I, I feel like you can grow in and grow out of love like with a lot of stuff so yeah it's very interesting so you talked about um you know ppi and that you kind of left that um what did you leave that into next what, what was so i went straight you? straight into being a mortgage advisor okay um so i bought my first home in 20 I applied for my first mortgage in 2018, got the keys in 2019, um, had a mortgage advisor, and so this was 2018, and essentially I just didn't think he did a good job. Um, <laughs> what did he do bad? Are you allowed to yes, <laughs> feel? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> spoke in nothing but jargon. Okay, I always, I always yeah. felt like he was in a rush to get to the meeting and then get out of the meeting. Okay. It was very transactional. Mm. Um, and yeah, I... I sat there and I thought, you know what? I think I can do a better job. Um, obviously, subject to becoming qualified. Mm. Um, so, yeah, and that sort of fell in turn with PPI coming to an end. So I began training and getting qualified as a mortgage advisor yeah. so that when PPI did end, I was ready to make a quick wow. transition. That's amazing. That's amazing. And how are you finding, you know, being a mortgage advisor and the years that you've done it for? I love it. So... Yeah. I work, as mentioned, I work primarily with first-time buyers. Mm -hmm. um, I love working with first-time buyers because it's not just transactional. It's, you know, people are extremely excited to to make one of the biggest purchases of their lives. They're mm -hmm. moving out of the parents' house, whatever it might be, and playing such a big part in somebody achieving that. Um, I genuinely do get a lot from it. You know, when yeah. somebody gets the mortgage offer, um, I genuinely get excited about it, which, yeah. you know, is, is good to say for a job. Yeah, it is. Yeah, like the... I remember the first time, uh, the first time, I've only done it once, but I remember when I, uh, you know, was like looking for mortgage advisors and going through the processes. Like you say, there's like so much to learn. Um, there's a lot of jargon out there. And um, I also bought in uh, 2019 as well. And 
Yeah, like I feel like when you've got a good mortgage advisor, they can kind of like hold your hands a little bit, yeah. like like through the process, explain a lot of things, mm-hmm. the pros and cons and stuff like that. Um, so I guess in terms of like your clients, where like majority of the, of them, where they're based? So I work nationally. So I okay. would say my cool. client split is around about one third in Sunderland, where okay. I'm from, yeah. one third in London mm-hmm. and one third elsewhere scattered okay. around the country i think that's around that's about the split okay cool and i guess what is like the sentiment at the moment currently in your world obviously i'm sure it's yeah. very very different to 2020 when you started i think 2020 probably around march at that point people are panicking probably yeah. nothing's happening and then when the government starts to say okay we're going to do i can't remember they're doing all of these kind of schemes they were doing no stamp duty, I think, I believe. Yeah. Lowering interest rates from what I remember. So obviously that's just like yeah. pumping a lot of activity into the market. So that's different versus now where mm. interest rates are getting a bit higher. Um, so yeah, I guess what you're seeing currently, like what are, in, in terms of like your conversations uh, with your clients and, um, you know, with all other mortgage yeah. advisors in the industry? Yeah, so it's it's maybe been quite, it was maybe quite a negative 2023 and end of 2022. Okay. Um, you know, the thing is at the moment is that, uh, well, actually, um, Harold, um, I believe it's Davies, who's the chairman of NatWest, has been in a little bit of trouble recently because he stated the other day that it's not that difficult to buy your first home. He said that? Yeah. Oh, my God. So why this, would he say that? So oh. this is a 72-year-old man who earns in excess of £750,000 per year. So is he out of touch? Of course. Very. Now, touch. when he bought his first home, let's, well, let's imagine... Um, in 1970, it had been around about 28. Um, at that time, the the wage in the average wage in comparison to the average house price was around about 3.5 times. Okay, so the average house price was 3.5 times the average wage. Now it's about nine times. Um, so that is where the issue is, and that's why it's so difficult. Um, you know, house prices have naturally over the last 50 years risen ahead of you know salaries. However, in 2020, especially, house prices did go up significantly. It was such a busy market. Um, as well as that, interest rates have shot up over the last, um, or maybe at the end of 2022, um, over 2023. So, yeah, it has been quite a difficult time. Um, 2023 had the, the lowest amount of first-time buyers in the okay. last 10 years. Wow. So there's a reason for that. But what I would say is, the last three months of 2023 were positive. Okay. Rates were sort of quite consistently coming down slowly across the market. Mm-hmm. Um, in 2024, we've seen more of that. Yeah. So things are looking more positive. Um, and yeah, I think I think it will look hopefully a brighter a brighter year. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're going to definitely delve into some of the numbers. That's fascinating in terms of, you know, I, I always knew that house prices was going up higher than salaries, but I didn't know... I didn't really sit down to think that, wow, actually the discrepancy is that much. Like yeah. that's kind of, that's kind of ridiculous. Yeah. And it's also ridiculous for the NatWest, you know, is it the chair. CEO, chairman? Yeah. I mean, how can you be on £750,000 and yeah. say, is it, I feel like you have to put yourself into people's shoes. Like, I think if you're using, if you're saying it from the perspective of the average salary, yeah. You know, oh yeah, okay, sure you can, but you're then you're really comparing it to your own situation. Yeah. It's kind of ridiculous, man. Yeah. Like his salaries is what some people's houses cost. Exactly, that's crazy. Well, some very uh, so very <laughs> wealthy people's houses cost, right? Yeah. Like, wow, that's okay. That's that's crazy. Okay, so we'll definitely we'll, we'll talk about that because I want to kind of get your thoughts in terms of like possible like solutions that you think yeah. that could um, help. Um, I guess in terms of you know areas. Um, that your clients are looking at in terms of affordability? Are you having like many clients that are living in London look like look elsewhere and be like, you know what, we're leaving. We're going to just leave London, go somewhere else. Yeah. So over 2023, I had lots of clients, whether it is London or elsewhere, who maybe it was the right time for them to buy in their life, but property prices were maybe higher than they would have liked. Interest rates were maybe higher than they would have liked. And therefore, they've maybe had to either look for um, maybe a cheap house in the area that they want to live in. Or in London, it's more common that people will sort of move slightly outside of London or or into different areas. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, absolutely. That's a conversation. Yeah. I've had a lot. Wow. Okay. That's that's crazy. And I guess 
Have you seen a slowdown from your side in terms of the amount of people coming to you and say, look, I want a mortgage as the interest rates have like, kind of gone, gone up? So not necessarily for me, um, not necessarily for me in my last 12 months because I've only been doing it sort of three years. Mm. So we're sort of on an upward trajectory still. Okay. But across the market, absolutely transactions slowed down. Mm. Um, I don't know what the exact figures are, yeah. but absolutely. Um, you know, I'm part of sort of a big mortgage advisor community online okay. with lots of posts every day. Yeah. And yes, there's been a lot of um, a lot of struggle, a lot of new advisors joining the industry and yeah. maybe having to leave because um, okay. it's just not enough. There wasn't really? enough business. Okay. And I guess you're kind of benefiting because you've, you've managed to be able to build your clients up uh-huh. from like 2020. You're not just like starting yeah. where interest rates are like, people are like, oh, I don't know, man. I might just wait. I was, I'm not going to lie. I was very close to being like, you know what? I'm just going to get a variable rate. I was a tracker rate. Sorry. I was yeah. very, very close. Actually, can you explain some of these things? Because again, we, we want to, you know, be as jargon free as, as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, what's like, what does a tracker rate mean and what does a fixed rate mortgage mean? Yeah. What does what are those terms? Yeah. So a tracker rate is a variable rate. So mm-hmm. it can go up and down month yeah. to month. Well, not necessarily month to month, month to month, but it can go up and down and okay. it tracks the Bank of England base rate. Okay. So a lender might have um, your interest rate is 0.5% below the Bank of England base rate or 0.5% above the Bank of England base rate whatever it might be, and it tracks the Bank of England base rate. Okay. okay. A fixed rate um, is not directly impacted by the Bank of England base rate. Okay. Okay. So a fixed rate, the lenders essentially set themselves depending on their margins. Obviously, they want to be competitive, but they want to make mm. money. Um, and a fixed rate will be fixed. Most, most commonly, two or five years are the most popular choices, but it can be three, it can be 10, it can be others but fixed for either two or five years. And what's most suitable depends on individual circumstances, goals, budget, et cetera. Yeah. But it's fixed and it's budget certainty. Okay, cool. Fantastic answer. Fantastic answer. Yeah, so I was I was very close to <laughs> doing the former, going on to the tracker rate, and then I just I just succumbed to it. And yeah. I went on a fixed rate and I'm not happy. <laughs> I'm not happy. <laughs> I was telling you off like, I'm not happy. No, because, and this is, is related to my next question. So... It's been reported Halifax have um, cut their rates again, I believe by about 1% or, or just over 1%. And um, I, when I fixed, I fixed at the end of October, my interest rate was over 5%, mm-hmm. about, I think about 5.64 or something like that. Yeah. Now it's like, I think Halifax are doing it in like the four point something yeah. range right within the space of two months by the way my ad right so uh, you know it's a bit annoying because it's like wait hold on so why didn't you just like you know offer that and right now in terms of like the average rates they're saying that the two-year fixed residential mortgage rate is about 5.8 percent that's what they're saying according to money facts and in the five years about 5.53 but that's been going down right so i guess why 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 is why is the rates going down i guess from your point of view what i would say is first of all is when we talk about average rates that information that you see online or that mm-hmm. the the you know the, the news might state the average rate yeah it's not very useful okay. because what is what's the use of an average rate because yeah. a rate will only go as low as let's say just under 4% at the moment okay. in the current market but it could go as high as 12% what? So depending <laughs> okay. on depending Look. on, you know, in extreme, in very, very extreme okay. circumstances. Wow. But when we're taking averages, yeah. It's maybe not a fair reflection of the market. Okay. Um, when it's expressed like that. Okay, fair. As an example, um, of where we are currently, what we do have to say is that rates change every single day. Mm-hmm. Every hour, okay. So when this, you know, when this podcast goes out, yeah. rates will be different. Yeah. Okay. But at the moment, um, you know, on a if you're buying a home on as a if you if you if you're purchasing a residential property with a ten percent deposit, on a two year fix, the best rate on the market will be something like four point nine nine percent. Okay. Okay. Um, on a standard mortgage product. Okay. And on a five year fix, it's going to be closer to four point five one. Okay. Okay. It's definitely gone down. So that's ten yeah. percent deposit. Now, 
as your deposit increases in groups of 5%, so 15%, 20%, 25%, generally speaking, your mortgage product will improve in line with that. Okay. It's not always completely linear, but it's mm. a general rule. That's how it works. Okay, so if you put more deposit, yeah. your interest rate's better, which means obviously you pay like less on a monthly basis. Okay. That's very that's very good to know. I guess where do you kind of see in 2024 looking ahead to 2025 where do you kind of see like interest rates going obviously in your opinion because obviously yeah. like you say it can change so again audience please do not take this as like gospel and then come and blame dan and say oh yeah he thought it was going down or up and you're like oh well it didn't that's not we're just having a conversation to kind of gauge where we think is like an educated discussion yeah, right yeah. i just make i'm just putting that disclaimer yeah. before people like you you know what people could be like right yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so with the market as i say it's been it's been a very positive last three months yeah rates have been coming down slowly with you know most of your mainstream lenders I would predict that that will continue slowly okay. um, in the short term, but there's simply no predicting what will happen mid to long term. Okay. Um, so many things can impact the market. You know, yeah, so many things can impact the market. So it's yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't like to give too much too much of a prediction. But what I would say is yeah. we're not going. I wouldn't expect us to go down to where rates were in 2020 or 2021. Okay, that was an all time low historically. Mm -hmm. That was the anomaly. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm not expecting to be back down there anytime soon. Oh, so if you're waiting for shame. that, you might be waiting a while. Wow, that's a that's a shame, isn't it? <laughs> it is. <laughs> oh my god! But to be fair, it's like ah, uh, it's like it's like the two evils. Which one do you choose? Because if the rates are lower, then they say the price, the house prices go up crazier, and it becomes it just you know exactly. stimulates the house price. But if they're higher, it's like people are like, oh, I can't afford it. So <laughs> exactly. So uh, there's, there's a lot to consider. Um, yeah. But fingers crossed it is. Yeah, it is positive. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> we'll that's crazy. OK, so obviously we've both bought uh, properties. I know I'm going to give my opinion on this yeah. as well, but I want to ask you the question first. In this current market, if you didn't buy a property, obviously you have all the knowledge you have. You've, you've got a property. I guess, would you <laughs> would you buy a property in this market or would you hold off? So when we're talking about buying residential properties, yeah, yeah. it's not solely an investment. Yeah. You do have to consider it as an investment, mm -hmm. but also you're getting a roof over your head, your mm -hmm. partner's head, your kid's head. It's your safe space. Yeah. Um, it's where you're going home after work. Um, so with that in mind, if it's the right time for you to buy in your life, yeah. so maybe you've got a partner and it's time to get your own place, maybe your rental agreement's coming to an end and you're sick of renting, Maybe it's time to move out of your mum and dad's house. If you can achieve your goal in the current market and it's the right time for you to buy, yes, it's a good time to buy. Yeah. Okay. Now, for some people, rates might be too high. <laughs> okay. Property prices might be too high. And I might have the conversation where, mm. you know, maybe it's not the right time. Yeah. But if you can achieve your goal, working with an advisor who can maybe make the mortgage work for you, keep it within budget, you can get the sort of property you want. It's a good time to buy. Reason being, we can't predict the future. If you're waiting for a perfect market, it might never come. Yeah. So you might be, you know, what would you be waiting for? Maybe waiting for rates to come down, waiting for prices to come down. But when will they come down? Are we <laughs> waiting six months or six years? That's a good point. Um, yeah. And how far will they come down by? How far will they have to come down by for you to be happy? 5%, mm -hmm. 20%? Um, That's a good point. <laughs> so if you're waiting for the perfect time, yeah. it might never happen. Yeah. Um. So there's the thought of, you know, the benefit of time in the market mm. versus timing the market. Yeah. You know, what? I forgot about that. I forgot about that statement yeah. because that, that kind of goes against what I was saying. But you know what? After everything you said, you are, you're absolutely right. It sounds like it's more on if you can afford it and mm -hmm. you're going to be comfortable yeah. paying it. Can you? And if not, yeah. then it's something you have to just maybe wait or you know, increase your income or um, get more of a deposit mm -hmm. or potentially wait, which actually you're right, even waiting, they're saying house price. I mean, this year they, they, they're they kind of saying that house prices might go down two to 4%, but you don't know. We don't, we never know that, right? And that's yeah. two to 4% generally, but some areas it could still, still go up. Yeah. That's well, what makes it so difficult. In my experience, so over, let's say the end of 2022, there was a lot of talk in the mainstream mm. media about the property market crash yeah. and how severe it was going to be. Mm -hmm. Now that never happened. 
Now, the market did slow down and maybe yeah. prices did come down, mm -hmm. but it maybe wasn't as severe as what yeah. it was, how it was being spoken about at times okay. by certain news outlets. Yeah. So, you know, some people may have put off buying for a period of time. Now, for some people, that might have been a good decision. Yeah. For others, not yeah. so much. But yeah, there's, there's simply no no guaranteeing the future. And yeah. as well as that, not only can the market change, your circumstances might change, mm -hmm. of which may prevent you from buying in the future. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. But you need to just have a balanced view on it. Yeah. I'm not saying 100% everybody go out and buy. Yeah. But yeah, make sure you're informed mm. um, and make your decision from there. Okay, fair. Because I, I was going for not buying. <laughs> no, but I, again, I'm not, this is not recommendation from either of us. This is more of a conversation to discuss why. For me, personally, I think, I think, maybe I'm a bit of a risk taker. I'm just like looking at it like, oh, it's going down, let me wait. But you're absolutely right. Like, how long do you wait till, yeah. till, till you go? Like, you could just be waiting forever. Mm -hmm. It could go to three and then it's like stays there and goes mm -hmm. back up to four. And you're like, oh my God, I just waited. And then, you know, so you got to be very careful yeah. with that and, approach. And there's, I would say there's four questions you should ask before buying. Yeah. Number one, can you afford the upfront costs? Deposit, survey, advice fees, solicitors. Two, can you avoid? Can you afford the monthly costs? So mortgage payments, related insurances, um, maintenance, all of those sorts of things. Three, will it add value to your life? So do you value the security or do you not? Are you happy renting? Maybe you want to be flexible so that you can go traveling, whatever it might be. So will it add value to your life? Four, what are the alternatives? So, you know, some the alternatives might be renting. So some people, you know, rather than buying, they might be quite happy with the rental situation. Other people might not be happy with their particular rental situation. Some people might be able to live with the parents and live a happy life in the parents for another couple of years. Others not so much. So what are the alternatives for you? With those four questions, um, that should maybe guide you towards the answer. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, you know, I've got this question for you. Like, obviously, you've seen so many clients. Have you ever had a situation with a client um, really wanting to get a mortgage and you said and you said to them, look, it doesn't make financial sense for you mm -hmm. right now? Have you had that conversation? And what was like the circumstances, I guess, around that conversation? Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, people when I've maybe assessed their finances and they've stated a budget that I agree with. So maybe they state a budget of X amount in terms of a monthly payment and they also want to buy this particular property. Um can they buy that property on this budget? No, not in the current market. Rates are too high. Okay. Or they don't have enough of a deposit to de decrease the loan amount and let them access a better rate. Yeah. So if that's the case, no, we either need to increase our deposit or wait until the market's more suitable or you've got a higher income, whatever it might be. But yeah, that's a conversation as an advisor we mm. can have because it's important. It's not my job to sell people the dream. Okay. Um, I love that. It's yeah. my job to make sure advice is balanced and balanced and true mm. um, to leave them in the best possible situation, make sure that they don't have any regrets. Yeah. And I, I love that you like said that, cause I think it's very, very important that, you know, that you're advising them, right. Yeah. Rather than, you know, some advisors just want to, you know, I've had some experiences, with some advisors, you know, you could, like you said, they just yeah. want to get you through the door. Yeah. It's not really, they don't really care about, mm -hmm what you're after they just want to just just get you yeah. through kind of the door and just tick tick the box and get you know get paid um which is which is a shame really and i like the fact that you said that like yeah. in that situation look guys no no it's not it's not the right time you need income needs to change deposit or the market needs to change right and yes short term maybe you've turned them away but long term they're going to trust you Way more, way more, and just keep on coming to you and then, you know, get other people to come to you as well, so. So ha what happens is that if we have that conversation, it'll be right, let's pencil yeah. the call on the diary for six months. Yeah. Let's do another one six mm. months after that. Catch up, has the deposit increased? Has mm. the market changed? Maybe the goals might change. Maybe yeah. they might think, right, you know what, actually, that property's too much. Do we want to buy something smaller? Yeah. Um, so yeah, you have regular catch ups, and they know that I'm not just there to, as I say, sell them, sell them yeah. the dream. So what what should people look for in an advisor? I don't even know because to be fair, when when I did mine again, I, th this conversation yeah. that we're having, there wasn't 
podcast well there wasn't podcasts that i knew about talking about this yeah there wasn't people like us online talking about this at that time mm -hmm. so i guess what should people kind of like yeah look for when you know to say yes this is a, a good advisor for me that can like help me so your relationship with a mortgage advisor could last 30 years when you keep remortgaging moving home yeah taking money out to build an extension whatever it might be so you want to work with someone who you like <laughs> because you're going to be talking to them a lot about something that's really important, who you trust. Um, and that will take different form for everybody. Now, I consciously step away from the man in the suit, corporate mortgage advisor. That's sort of my decision. Mm. Some people like that and choose to work with me. Um, some people wouldn't. Some people would rather go to a big corporate sort of high street organization. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, as long as you're choosing somebody who, yeah, who you like, who you trust, um, and who you want to be involved in such a big thing. Yeah, that's important. That's very, very, you're, you're absolutely right. I think nowadays as well, like the whole corporate, mm. <laughs> it's true. Like, the, I like the fact that you, like you said, you're not the whole corporate because I feel like you appeal to like millennials and Gen yeah. Z, right? Who these days, I don't even think they kind of turned off that a little bit. Yeah. And um, again, they're consuming a lot of, um, you know, information online on the social media channels that we're on. And I feel like they can relate to us a, yeah. a bit more because they then understand that we've, um, you know, we've also gone through that process and we understand the struggles yeah. that they've kind of gone through. So I wanted to kind of do a bit of, it's not really myth busting, mm -hmm. but kind of like conventional wisdoms that's kind of i think changed as you know as the market's changed so i remember when i got my mortgage in 2019 back then i to be fair it's, it's crazy i wanted to get three years right at first or five years i think three, three or five years but the conventional wisdom at that point was oh just get a two year because you know in another two years yeah. you can you know draw money out um of the property out if the property is increasing value um and interest rates are gonna mm -hmm. you know likely they're gonna stay there right so that was that was a conventional wisdom and i kind of went with that yeah. and i'm not blaming anybody i'm just saying that was a conventional wisdom then um rather than getting a, a five-year you know or 10-year whatever else right fixed rate um uh, interest rate um, mortgage so i guess has that changed is that chatter like changed in the in the circles with people you're talking about with and stuff like that. So are you recommending two year fixes or five year fixes is probably the most common question I'm asked. <laughs> yes. Okay. And the answer is okay. both. Okay. Because cool. it does depend on the individual, their circumstances, what their yeah. goals are, what their budget is, mm. what their appetite for risk is. Mm. Um so it's two year fixes or five year fixes or maybe something else depending on the individual. There's definitely no one size fits all answer. Um, and yeah, you know, does somebody, would somebody prefer the, the flexibility yeah. or the budget certainty, uh, you know, the, sorry, the longer budget certainty of a five year fix as well as that in the current market, as of the time of this recording, generally speaking, five year fixes are going to be cheaper than two year fixes mm -hmm. generally. Um, so these are all things that we're weighing up as well as that. What's your future plans? Are you staying in your house for five years mm -hmm. is this just a stepping stone for the next couple of years do you want to remortgage in two years and build an extension yeah these are all yeah. things that we'll have to consider when we're recommending either a two-year okay. or a five-year okay cool i did okay so a lot of other people are thinking about it because it, the dynamics has kind of yeah. changed i mean before it was a no everybody's like oh, it was a no-brainer two years but yeah. i'm like why yeah. it's more flexible like and yeah. the at that point, the rate, the difference between the, the rates wasn't crazy between two and five, I remember. So, okay, cool, 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 cool. Another thing, another common question, maybe maybe to you, a lot of people were asking again before was overpaying your mortgage. A lot of people mm -hmm. said when the interest rates were low, there's no point, right? You might as well put that money into the stock market or yeah, really it was the stock market because at that point, the interest savings accounts wasn't, mm -hmm. wasn't much, right? So where do you kind of stand on the whole overpaying uh, mortgages? So if you're talking about overpaying on your mortgage versus the benefit of investing elsewhere, yeah. I would always start off and say I'm not an investment advisor, but um, if somebody's sort of main priority is maximizing the benefit that they can get from their money. Investing elsewhere, 
depending on your investment, can be um, more 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 beneficial. Mm-hmm. However, reality is that most people, or a lot of people in the UK, prefer security and value the security of overpaying the mortgage and just knowing that in so many years they're going to have a mortgage-free yeah. home over the head for them and the kids um, without the mortgage payment. So again, it does depend on the individual. Um, is somebody looking to invest and get maximum benefit? Mm-hmm. Um, or is somebody just looking to have the security of a mortgage-free home as soon as possible? Um, and the advice would differ from there. But in terms of overpayments, if it is important for you to be mortgage-free quicker, yeah, overpaying on your mortgage can save you a lot of money and many years on the mortgage. Yeah. If you just use a simple calculator, overpayment calculator online, you can put in the figures, you know, if I overpay by £50 per month for two years, mm. what will the saving be? Yeah. Um, and it's normally more than what you would have thought. Yeah. It's crazy. There was one I was doing on the weekend. I think it was like extra. Again, don't quote me specifically on this. Um, I think I, I was just playing around with it. It was like extra three, four hundred pounds, I think, a month would like pay off eight years earlier, mm-hmm. something crazy like that. I was like, that's insane mm-hmm. to be able to like, you know, and then what was cool about this particular calculator, you could also then compare overpaying versus mm-hmm. like, like if you put it into a savings account and then see like what's kind of better for you. But like you said, it's not guaranteed because even with a savings account, even if it's 5% today, it could change uh-huh. in like, couple years so you that that rate's not there so it's it's like you said it's like what do you kind of like value okay great just to just to touch on that though if you do put the money into overpaying your mortgage yeah any savings that you've got if you do put that into an overpayment and then the next week your car breaks down you can't just take it back out so that's a consideration very good don't put all of your emergency funds into it because you can't take it out a day later yeah very very (laughs) that's that is very that's a very good point you're right you can't no and when it comes to remortgaging, and actually, actually, can, yeah, can you explain remortgaging? Because again, yeah, jargon. What, what's when we say remortgage? What do we uh, mean? So typically, for most people, it would be time to remortgage at the end of your fixed term deal. Okay, so if you're on a two year fix, you can start securing your new new deal six months before the end of your current deal. Okay, so remortgaging. Um, the reason why you would remortgage is that at the end of your fix, you will typically move on to your lender standard variable rate, which is variable and generally a higher rate. So you want to secure your new fixed term deal. Now, when you do remortgage, you are taking a new mortgage to suit your new circumstances and new goals at mm-hmm. that time. So it might be with a new new lender. Yeah. It might be a new interest rate. You might shorten or lengthen your, your mortgage term. You might move from a two-year fix to a five-year fix or vice versa or whatever it might be. It's a new mortgage to suit your new goals at that time. Okay, cool. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Absolutely, absolutely brilliant answer on remortgaging. And talking about remortgaging, I, as I was saying, uh, my remortgage, oh, wow. So I was, I'm pretty sure I was on three point fix rate. It just kept on going up. So I got my first deal in 2019 i can't sp- remember the exact rate but it was in the two percent and then i remortgaged two years later in 2021 and then that went to about in the three percent i think it was like three point i think it was 3.6 something 3.6 something and i recently just remortgaged and as i was saying earlier it's like 5.69 yeah. <laughs> and my cost my monthly costs have increased like crazy it's gone up like about four hundred pound. I'm like, oh, this is yeah. this is crazy, right? Um, so, and I've been seeing a lot of news articles of um, people, you know, like having different kind of situations. Some people saying, I think it was like from one thousand four hundred to um, to like, oh yeah, one thousand four hundred, two thousand one hundred. If they were to remortgage now, their their mortgage not up. Yeah. And there was another person that was going to wait like their 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 mortgage was like four thousand nine hundred and they're just gonna wait and just be on a standard variable variable rate for uh their their mortgage um through their current mortgage and it's gonna go up to like eight thousand eight hundred and they're saying that's gonna be afford unaffordable so it got me thinking right that there might be a few people 
in situations where they're like, it, it might be a, a genuine struggle for mm -hmm. them, right? Maybe some months they can pay, maybe they'll eat into savings, but at some point in the savings, mm -hmm. like kind of like, you know, run away. So I guess my question is, if you are struggling to keep up your payments, yeah. right? I guess, what can somebody do aside from like selling their property, I yeah. guess, in that kind of situation? So it will always be a case of speaking to your current lender and finding out what the terms are in your agreement. So um, over, well, in 2023, due to the cost of living crisis and rates going through the roof, um, the government released something called the Mortgage Charter, which was essentially designed to help people navigate that financial period. Um, things such as, um, so, you know, depending, not, you know, most lenders signed up for this, and um, th there's benefits such as maybe you can lengthen the term of your mortgage to bring down the monthly payment. Maybe some lenders will allow you to switch on to interest only for a, a specific short period to get through the next few months. Some lenders actually will allow you to take mortgage holidays, okay, okay. for a very short period of time when things are difficult. But it depends on the lender. Speak to your lender. Find out what your options are. Um, and yeah, what changes you can make. Another thing to consider is that if somebody has secured a rate, okay, so that whether they are buying a home or remortgaging, if they've secured a rate but they haven't completed yet, as rates come down, they may be able to switch on to a lower rate with that lender, okay? So the other day, I switched five, H six including me, six clients including myself with HSBC onto lower rates, these are all clients who are post-mortgage offer, but they haven't completed yet on a lower rate because HSBC reduced the rates. Okay. Okay. So if you haven't completed yet, you may be able to switch on to a lower rate with that lender. There will be another credit check, so you need to do so on an advised basis. However, those options are there. Okay. Amazing. Amazing. And this is another question that I've never been through this and I don't know anybody that's been through this, mm -hmm. but I guess there, there's going to be some people who may be worried about this. Defaults. First of all, can you explain what defaults are? And then the second question is, is there an amount of time that people can default before the bank are like, you know what, right, we're, we're going to just take this property and sell it and get our money back? Okay, so... Default is is just it's just one form of adverse credit. So, yeah. um, there's arrears, defaults, CCGs, yeah, and then there's worse. Yeah. Okay, there's also things such as debt management plans, mm. um, within that. Yeah. Okay. So these are all forms of adverse credit mm -hmm. on you know whether it's on your mortgage or your credit cards or your utility bills, whatever it might be. Okay. So, if you have um, was the question regarding being. How many times can you default before the property is repossessed? Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. So um, within the mortgage charter, one of the um, points of that was that a lender who signed up for that can't repossess the property within 12 months of that first missed payment. Okay. Within 12 okay. months of the f oh. first missed payment on the mortgage. Hey, that's okay. interesting. Okay. Unless, I think there is a caveat, unless there's extreme circumstances. Okay. Okay. So that sort of answers, you know, that question. Um, but yeah, in terms of adverse credit and, you know, how that impacts mortgage options, there's a yeah. lot to touch, you can touch on that. Yeah, we're definitely going to answer that question. Okay. So obviously, yes. Okay. It sounds like potentially you might be protected for 12 months, but in terms of coming to remortgage, it could really mess you up. Potentially, it could potentially re mm -hmm. like mess you up. It can also mess up your relationship with your current lender. They might not want to, you know, is there cases that they could they could be like you know what we're not we're not going to keep you around anymore once you your deals finish they're like nah so there can be what i would say is that there's no one size fits all answer for credit history okay yeah. so again arrears defaults ccgs anything worse um lenders will consider the dates of the yeah. event okay so um the closer we are to when you had that that yeah. event of bad credit the worse it will be for your options okay the values involved, okay, so was it for £2 or £2,000? Yeah. And is that a, sort of, is that issue now satisfied or not? So if you did default, is that satisfied um, or is it still ongoing and you haven't maybe yeah. sorted it out? Now, with bad credit, um, every lender has a different credit criteria. So if your, if your 
the credit file. It doesn't meet criteria for one lender. It doesn't mean that it won't for another. So that's sort of my job to look at your credit file and then pair you with a lender where it fits. Um, you know, there's, there's Equifax, Experian, TransUnion. They may be the credit report providers that lenders will use primarily, but each of those will hold different information about you in your credit file. And um, believe it or not, so you, one of your accounts might be on Equifax, but not on Experian. Okay. So when I see that, you know, you might have a, a bad credit issue that isn't actually showing with one of the providers. And therefore, I might be able to to pair you with a lender who uses that particular provider. Okay. So if you are downloading a credit report, I always recommend check my file. It's a multi-report multi provider. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's also the easiest to look at. Mm. Um, it's broken down in the nicest way because it can be, it can look like algebra, yeah. sort of trying to read a credit <laughs> report unless you do it every day. Yeah. So, okay, so it, it does, it sounds like it is possible to be able to get property with bad credit. It is. I yeah. do it all the time. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Okay, because a lot of people get worried about that. Like, oh, I've got bad credit. I can't get a property. They just resign themselves to the fact so they don't even try. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. So, so it is possible. Okay. It is possible, but depending on the severity. Yeah. Okay. The severity is, you know, will impact what your options are. You may end up with a higher interest rate. Mm. You may need more of a deposit. But typically there may be some form of option out there. It's just whether that option is affordable for you or not. Okay, cool. And I guess what tips would you you have for somebody, you know, to, uh, to get, you know, getting a mortgage around with, with a bad credit score? I guess what tips do you have around that? So if you do already have bad credit, get in touch with the mortgage advisor as soon as possible. Mm. Send them a check my file credit report. That's always what I would ask for and have that reviewed, okay? So let them review that, see where the issues are, and then advise on what changes you need to make to achieve your goal. So do you need to satisfy any issues? Do you, is it a case of, right, well, you know what, you need to add an extra 5% to, to your deposit? Um, do you need to wait a year? Um, and that will then allow you to sort of um, know where you stand right now, but also in the future, and make sure you are achieving that goal at some point. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, because that's one of, I think that's the one of the main things people worry about, their credit score. Uh -huh. Maybe they did, they, you know, they messed up when they didn't really know much about it. Nothing was explained to them, like me. I've, I've spoken about that, that yeah. story several times. Or, um, you know, they're also worried about deposit. Those are the two main worries, I uh -huh. think, from from most people now there's a third thing the interest rates that's yeah. the that's a third third thing that that people are worried about so another thing that again i don't see many people discussing anymore is a five percent deposit is that that's something that's still happening around are they are yeah. lenders still like offering that out to the market absolutely so yeah five percent yeah. deposit mortgages are available um you know many people are accessing them um, you know, 5% deposit mortgage will come with an interest rate that's higher than 10% mm. generally. Um, but yeah, if that is, if you have a 5% deposit and you are ready to buy and you can make the figures work, mm. then there's absolutely nothing wrong with okay. buying with a 5% deposit. It's a yeah. great opportunity yeah. um, if it does work yeah. for you. Because a lot of people like, let me not say a lot, but I think some people um, kind of scoff at it a little bit. Like, oh, 5%, no, get the 10%, don't do 5%. You're kind of, yeah. you know, I guess where do you kind of, it sounds like where you stand on it is that you're quite balanced on it. Like, you're like, yeah, if it works for you, definitely go for it. If it works for you, it works for you. You know, your interest rate isn't a competition. Um, you know, but, oh, I can't believe you bought with a 5% deposit and you've accessed this, you've used this interest rate. But everybody's circumstances are different. We don't all have um, so much sitting in the bank or deposit from parents or whatever it might yeah. be. That's reality. So there's nothing wrong with the 5% deposit. There are considerations. You know, there's, there's you do have to be a little bit more of aware of the potential for negative equity if the property value was to decrease. Um, so negative equity is essentially where your property value decreases below your yeah. mortgage amount. Um, so because you've got a smaller deposit, there's sort of more chance of that. However, as long as you're aware of that, yeah. and again, you're making an advised and informed decision, there's nothing wrong with a 5% deposit. Lots of people use it every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, honestly, it's like, I, I think the message I'm definitely getting from our conversation is that it sounds like if it works for you, 
mm-hmm. and the numbers work for you and the circumstances work for you, then like kind of go for it. Don't really watch what other people are are doing. Just like do your own thing kind of. Okay. I like that. I like that advice. Um, I guess I was also thinking, is there anything that can like completely ruin your chance of, you know, getting a mortgage and getting yourself onto the property ladder, like things that people, especially the first time buyers, they haven't bought, but they're looking to buy and things that they can kind of steer away from, basically. So the main one would be the adverse credit, okay. bad credit, especially in the lead up to a mortgage application, yeah. because although there might be options out there for you, you know, if if I'm going to then have to tell you, right, because you've had this issue with your credit or these issues, um, you do need this this size deposit or your interest rate will be this and therefore that might cause a problem for you. Mm. Um, so it's looking after your credit. But what I, what I always say is that you shouldn't, in an ideal world, we shouldn't need a master plan to have a credit score that's good enough to buy a home. If you just look after your credit, if you're 18 years old and you just look after your credit, you know, you don't miss any payments. You're not taking out um, a debt that's disproportionate to your income. You're going to be there or thereabouts when it comes to buying a home. I know there's a lot of there's a lot of apps these days. You know how to how to boost your credit score and mm. all these things. And there is a place for them, but we don't always need a master plan. It can often be very simple things, and if possible, just not making the mistakes in the first place. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, no more, no more. Uh car loans no I'm kidding I don't want to attack no, the car loans there's but... nothing wrong with car loans I've yeah. got a car loan okay so I've got a... I, to be fair I had one yeah. before yeah I've... I mean expensive ones like I've... the 50k yeah, yeah. ones <laughs> no, so, no. I've got a car loan of which is proportionate yeah. to income yeah so that's fine yeah but if you are starting to get a car loan that you can't afford and you go always like payments, tub- double your income that's something double your income yeah. or even the same as your annual salary um that's meaning that your debt to income ratio mm. is going through the roof um, and yeah, you might start to miss payments and that's where the problems come from. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I love that. I love that. I love that answer because I think, again, it sounds like, and we have a lot of these kind of conversations where we're talking about, you know, financial habits, where we're talking about, you know, things that you should do. We're talking about the education. And I think, of course, you know, I wasn't, I don't know if you were. Were you taught like financial education? Do you like, do you all. kind of teach yourself and not at all learn? Yeah, um, yeah. So I actually I'm quite big on, especially in sort of young working class men. I yeah. don't feel there's enough education there. Definitely in terms not of real life education. Yeah. So at the moment, if you look on Instagram for financials, mm. there's a lot of financial influencers, and mm. I would say it's more heavily weighted towards the females. Yeah. Um, it's it's typically quite feminine and there's nothing mm. wrong with that. Mm. But I don't think there's anything there for young men. Yeah. Um in terms of real life um financial habits and education. So payday loans, mm. um, taking out too much debt, gambling. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the gambling one's a big you know, one, yeah. Lifestyle inflation. Yeah. Um this, this the social and cultural pressures mm. that come with being a man financially. Yeah. I don't think there's enough there's anything out there. 100%. That. That's um, a good point. That's because, a you know, a lot point. of the time, met, you know, people are turning 18 and they're taking out credit card debt because it's coming through the door. Mm. Um, they're taking out a payday loan to go out to go out on the drink. Mm. Um, you know, I'm from Sunderland. There's a lot of, there's a big pub culture. There's a big football culture. Yeah. You know, when I was 18, even before 18, you would go to the pub. You would go to the bookies and put a bet yeah. on. You would go to the match. That's just that was a normal did. culture. That's just okay. what you do. Okay. Okay. Um, but the problem with that is that that can cause a lot of problems for some people. Um, and there's maybe not enough sort of education around. You know, as I say, gambling's a big one. Um, I would say, um, especially in, in, in my area, I would say everybody knows somebody with a gambling problem. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think financial education, but real life sort of down to earth. Mm. Um financial information for young men yeah to make sure that they just sort of um they've got solid foundations there for when they do get to 25 yeah and sort of becoming a, a, a real man in terms of they want to maybe have a family or buy a house or whatever it might be yeah no it's very important you're absolutely right especially like when you're talking about the financial pressures because i think especially like as a as a man like if you're seeing your fellow friends doing financially yeah. well and you're like 
you feel like you're broke, mm -hmm. there's almost a pressure to be like, actually, I've got to kind of step it up. And then, like you said, you might start taking payday loans, loans, credit card debt, all of this kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Not knowing that actually we all have our own journeys and we should all be, you know, going on our own paths. And, okay, somebody else has what they have. That's cool. Yeah. But, you know, you just mm -hmm. focus on kind of what you're doing. But you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it is important. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if we... <laughs> If we if we did some research into the, like the debt stats, that yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there there was a bit of a big problem there. And the gambling thing is interesting too, especially when it's linked to like sports. I'm a I'm a massive football fan, like yeah. like, and betting on football is so easy. It's so easy. Like it's, it's I mean you the betting companies are like advertised by them as well. So like yeah. it's like a whole like yeah. you know. So you you gotta kind of be very 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 careful, especially if you you know you're good start winning on bets and stuff like that yeah that's yeah it's, it's yeah it's insane it's absolutely insane um and obviously it, it sounds like you're going to be doing a lot of trying to cover some of those elements right yeah uh -huh. okay you're going to try and cover that yeah <laughs> okay cool um so i wanted to do like a little bit of a scenario right because mm -hmm. um we were talking about like the um average we're talking about average property prices so I, I i got here that the average uk property price is around two hundred eighty-seven thousand. by the time they listen to this it might might change it's always fluctuating and right now the average salary i'm seeing is between thirty-four thousand to about thirty-eight thousand, right so that's kind of like what it is right so if you were to get a 10 percent deposit on that two hundred eighty-seven thousand property that's around 28,700 right as as a 10 percent deposit and then the five percent is about 14,355 mm -hmm. is that doable yeah it's potentially doable you're probably gonna like save for a while but in terms of the actual mortgage the maximum mortgage and I know it can kind of change like with age what's like that kind of maximum that somebody can kind of get for like the 34,000 to the 38,000 roughly ish so typically most lenders will yeah. go up to four up to four point five times okay. the income on the application. Okay. However, there are variables that will bring that down. Okay. How much debt do you have? What's your credit history like? Mm. Do you have children? Mm. Um things like that will impact it. But okay. most lenders for most people will go up to four point five times. Okay. Now if you especially if you are a higher earner, there are some lenders that will go higher, maybe yeah. five point five times. But that's subject to meeting sort of um certain criteria and it's not yeah. going to be available to everybody yeah amazing amazing and then i guess as well if we you know in terms of tips can you like provide some tips in terms of like the bet to give people the best chances to be able to like get themselves ready and prepped yeah. to you know like when it comes time they can just pass it with flying colors and they're yeah. able to like just get their, their mortgage so i always say it's never ever too early to have a conversation with a mortgage advisor so whether you're looking to buy in six months, a year, two year, three years, just have an initial conversation with a mortgage advisor, a very relaxed chat through your circumstances, what your goals are, mm -hmm. any potential hurdles in the way. Maybe do you have bad credit? Are you worried about um, maybe being self-employed? Um, maybe you, you don't have a deposit. And with that, you can get a solid idea of where you are. If anything does need to change, do I need to decrease my debt? Do I need to increase my income? Mm -hmm. um, you know, do I need to adjust um, th what the goal is? Mm -hmm. But that will just allow you to then move forward on an informed basis. So, yeah, have a chat as early as possible yeah. with a mortgage advisor. And then it makes, you know, if, if it means that you're, you're not getting to the time for buying a house. And so sort of it's guesswork. Yeah. And you, suddenly you find out you're not ready. Maybe you've never looked at your credit report before. And there's an issue there that you haven't resolved, which yeah. you could have resolved. Um, so yeah, early chat, um, find out where you stand, find out what it is you need to do, even if it is two or three years away. Yeah, amazing. So in terms of like, you know, this is a point that I really, really wanted wanted to make in terms of, you know, the average age of a first time buyer. I think like a lot of people's perception is that, you know, everybody on social media is getting like property young, 21, 22, 23. You know, everybody has got the keys. But actually, I was looking at some, you know, statistics and it was saying that the average age of a first time buyer 
is between 32 and 33. So it's actually a lot older mm -hmm. than people think. And that's the average, right? Um, so it means that like, you know, if you're, you're coming out of uni at 21, it's really you're buying your property after 10 to 11 years, which actually kind of makes sense when you think about your career, right? It gives you enough time to, you know, progress in your career and then save enough money. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, do a bit of traveling in between that, maybe take a bit of work break and all that kind of stuff um out of it so it kind of makes sense and it kind of destroys that whole perception that you mm -hmm. need to be buying property like yeah. you know young younger and putting that pressure mm -hmm. that you need to be buying property by 30 when the average age is above that right yeah. so i guess like what are your kind of like thoughts on that yeah so i think the the age is increasing one because it is getting harder to buy that mm -hmm. gap between the average wage and average um, house price is widening all of the time so it's simply getting harder to buy as well as that, as you've alluded to, culturally, I think some people are waiting a little bit longer. The world's opening up with technology and, you know, more people maybe want to travel or switch between careers or do different things or rent in different places and move about. Um, but yeah, definitely don't buy into the into the pressures of it. Everybody's story is different. Um, yeah, it's certainly not a race. And just because somebody's bought sooner, doesn't mean they've bought better and it doesn't mean that they're ahead it's just one one it's a it's a different box ticked at a different time love that just because they bought sooner it doesn't mean that they bought better that is so true because you hear so many stories of people and again we we all want to be successful in you know yeah. buying property and make sure that we invest but again it's to do it with your own time and not rush a lot of people feel like they just rushed into yeah rushed into it before i bought my property i had been saving for like seven eight years i first you know i was living at parents for for quite a, a while and then i was renting for about you know three years before mm -hmm. you know i was ready to yeah. be like go all in yeah. so yeah i think it's i think it's really important to do it on your your own in terms of this market right do you believe a lot of people are saying that they they think like it's a bit of a broken property market and i kind of agree and it goes back to the figures that we were talking about before like how you're saying it was in terms of income is like the the gap is that nine times now is increased that much i guess from your opinion what do you think needs to happen to kind of rectify it or make it better for like first time buyers? It's a difficult one because I would say what is rectifying it and you would say um, house prices coming down to a reasonable amount where people are happy with. But is that ever going to happen? Probably not. But what can they, they do? They can build more houses more options, um, you know what I mean? Then there'll be more sellers on the market, therefore helping to control the demand and yep. hopefully helping to control property prices. Um, but hopefully more schemes, you know, the lifetime ISA scheme is a fantastic, that's a fantastic option for people that does actually help most first time buyers. Um, so more things like that. Um, but yeah, in reality, will it ever be the perfect scenario? Probably not because that gap hasn't just been widening for two years. Mm. Um, it's been widening for the last 50. Yeah. And that lifetime myself, can you talk about it? And then I'll talk about my experience. What is the, the yeah. lifetime ISA? So the lifetime ISA is essentially a savings account aimed at first time buyers. Okay. So you can contribute £4,000 annually up to £4,000. Okay. And the government will add a 25% bonus on top of that. So if you save £4,000, the government will add a grand. And it's essentially a free grand towards um, buying your first home. Now, if you save more year on year, um, you can get more of a bonus. So it's, it's a great opportunity, but to be balanced, there are considerations. You can only benefit from a lifetime ISA up to a property value that you're purchasing of £450,000. If you're buying above that, um, you can't use and benefit from your lifetime ISA. Um, as well as that, you can't benefit from the lifetime ISA within 12 months of making your first payment. So if you are looking to buy next week or within the next 12 months, it's maybe not for you at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's that's that is one thing that I think changed my life when I, I had heard about obviously help to buy ISA came yeah. out first. Then I was doing a bit of research and then heard about the lifetime ISA. I was like, yeah, that's that's a no brain. I'm yeah. not buying right now. Yeah. I've got a few years to save, and that that was quite life changing because I think I, I think I I got between three to four grand because I was yeah. saving for three to four years. Or well, I had money before, mm -hmm. but obviously in that in that time when it came out. 
Um, yeah, so I ended up getting, like you said, like four grand for free, yeah, which yeah. was, to me, that was amazing. I was like, this is something that just straight up into the house. And I always, as soon as I found out about it, I just started telling everybody else about it. Even if you, like what I initially did, the advice was to, even if you're not going to start you to contributing to it, to it straight away, just open it one pound. Yeah. And, and, you know, start the clock ticking. Exactly. Yeah. Like there's so many benefits out there that you can really use to your advantage. And I think that was one of the things that I kind of really used to my advantage to be like, okay, that's going to help me kind yeah. of like get, get ahead. So yeah, that was, no, that was amazing. It's been so great talking to you, Dan. Like I, I feel like we've learned a lot. I definitely would love to do um, another episode in the future, you know, just at, maybe end of the year, just to see how like the market like turned out. But um, yeah, I guess what, what do you have planned for next for yourself? Um, so I, I say I'm, I'm moving house myself in March. Um, I've got a baby due in May. Oh, congratulations. Um, so busy few months ahead. I'm running a marathon in April. So busy few months ahead. Wow. Um, as well as that, just trying to help more home buyers and more first time buyers than ever this year. Um, I want it to be the busiest year. I want to help more people. Um, so yeah, that's the, the ultimate goal. Amazing. Amazing. And hopefully, you, you know, there are some people that if they do want to reach out to you, I guess, where, where's the best place for them to reach out to you? Get so, more information. My main social media channel is Instagram, which is at Dan Does Mortgages underscore. Um, it's Dan Does Mortgages on all of the other social media channels. Um, LinkedIn, it's Dan Not. Um, so yeah, if anybody does want to have a chat or even just take in the, the content that's there, that's there to help help people. So yeah, you know where I am. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, it's been it's been so good, very knowledgeable, and I feel like a lot of people can relate to you because you've also been through the um, house buying process. You understand what it was like during COVID. You understand what it's like after COVID. And you know, are you a millennial or Gen Z? I, I don't really relate. I don't, I don't really. I don't really call myself either. I think you're. I think you're millennial then. Yeah, yeah I, I think, genuinely I think, don't know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let, let me. I'm just using this generally group. <laughs> let me just. I don't want to be rude and say young people because yeah. I think your advice can be helpful to everybody. Yeah. Right. Um. So you know, and that's the most important thing that it comes as very relatable. It's not purposely trying to, um, you know, be jargon heavy mm -hmm. and sound smart smarter than people so that they don't even yeah. understand what you're yeah. talking about right it's very relatable and i think that this this episode a lot of people are going to relate to it and understand it in terms of final words do you have any final words for the audience um just as you've just mentioned there what i try and do is make mortgage advice accessible digestible and hopefully enjoyable um so yeah as you mentioned when you're picking an advisor just pick one that worth you know pick somebody who's a good fit for you that may be somebody like myself. It might be the total, total opposite, and that's fine. But yeah, work with somebody who you're confident in. Yeah, thank you, Dan. It's been great having you. Watchers, listeners, thank you for tuning into this episode of the podcast, and we'll see you next week's episode. <laughs>